So this is our multispectral camera system, and it is in, as you can see, its own dark box, uh, because the point of multispectral cameras is, is that you want to take uh, very controlled ranges of lights. We're all familiar with black lights that, you know, college kids have the posters that you see with the UV, or in crime shows, they're always like sweeping rooms with UV light for traces of blood or other, you know, liquids. Um, and so just as certain uh, things that you might encounter day to day might fluoresce or react differently in different colors of light, so many of our pigments that we use in manuscripts uh, will react differently in different types of lights. And so um, we are trying to control the light as much as possible in order to remove, oh, there, you push in. I thought this is the one where you pulled out. I'm sorry. So um, here is our system and an apology that uh, somewhat embarrassingly, the cable which allows us to completely automate it with the computer is broken today and it is a bespoke product that has to come from the USA and they did not start soldering a new one until we put in the order. So we will be demonstrating the actual uh, camera and the equipment and how it works, uh, but uh, we'd love to have the whole showing you every shot as it comes in, but that automation part is the part that's broken. And me manually taking photos is not necessarily the most exciting because this is what you see when the camera is actually in operation. But uh, because multispectral photography has a lot of differences with uh, normal photography, but a lot of similarities in terms of this setup with the stuff that you're seeing, I'd like to walk through. I have a few slides just in case you're not familiar with like really basic physical properties that we'll do in the after. So just keep in mind that if a little bit of this is a bit confusing, uh, one, ask questions, two, I hope I have a couple slides that will not bore those that are familiar with photography, but will help those um, who are not. Because one of the things that we always need to keep in mind with photography are physical limitations that we don't even think of or that we take for granted in our day-to-day -day life, right? We keep pushing more and more megapixels onto our cell phone cameras, but there are actually a lot of physical limitations to how sensors and how lenses work, which means that at a certain point, you're just, you know, as they say on Reddit, line goes up, but it doesn't meaningfully add to the quality of the image you get. There's specifically a thing that happens at very high, uh, it's actually not the pixel count that matters, it's the pixel size, but as uh, sensors stay the same size and we put more pixels on them, the pixels themselves get smaller. And there's something called the uh, circle of confusion where at some point photons are limited in that they will not actually hit the photodiode that they're supposed to be activating. And so uh, at certain depths of field, at certain pixel sizes, you stop getting better quality, you get bigger uh, you get more pixels, but they're limited in how sharp they can get. Uh, similarly, the way cameras work have all kinds of physical limitations in them. That means a multispectral system has um, different needs than a visible light system. Now, we have done in the past, and you can do as a kind of cheap and dirty version, what we used to do for ultraviolet photography. I don't know if anyone remembers this, but we used to put ultraviolet film in our camera. You put an ultraviolet filter on, which looks black, because it blocks all visible light. And then you go take a picture of trees in a lake, and all the trees are this translucent, ghostly white, and all the grass is this deep blue color, and it's just this otherworldly thing. Well, you can do that. You can shine UV light on something. The sun's a great source of UV light and you can put a filter on it, and you can use film that is specifically UV sensitive, and you can do that. But once we switched over to digital cameras, we started doing things, and I'll show you a sensor uh, diagram like putting infrared filters 
directly on the sensors because we don't want in day-to-day -day life to shoot infrared. And the sensor is sensitive to infrared, but we don't see it. So when you get infrared bloom on your images, it looks wrong to us because our cameras are optimized around reproducing visible light as much as possible in the way that we see it. So this camera back has had a couple things done to it. It is a normal Sony digital camera, but we have removed the filters that are we. We sent it off to a company and they removed the filters that are on the sensor. Uh, so it will see infrared light. Well, that immediately causes the problem of what if we don't want infrared light? Well, part of that is why we have it in a blacked out tent. So this tent allows us to control the light, this panel, and the one on the left is on, the one on the right is dark at the moment, uh, is switchable to different set wavelengths of light. So here we have UV light that is currently on. I can switch it to visible light in the 420 range. Uh, and through all of these various lights um, that um, represent slices of the spectrum, visible and invisible. Now the thing here is that these LED panels are great, they produce light spectra, but they're still broader than we generally want for precise analysis because um, sometimes it's actually a very narrow spectral range that shows a big difference between one pigment and another or which provides you the best contrast with the other material that you're trying to identify on the page. So here, this wheel here contains filters and the filters cut off uh, the light so that we are putting out a wider spectrum of light with the specialized lights and then we are cutting it off on either end with the filters. And this piece of software actually allows us to automate that we are going to choose this light and this filter set so that we know that we are getting this range of light particularly. And then you can shoot, uh, in this case, the way it's set up, 20 images at a time. Feel free to uh, take a look at this or play with it later. Um, and um, we will get into a moment whether you always want to shoot uh, in the lecture part, whether you actually want to shoot 20 images uh, and what are you going to do with them. Those are entirely other issues, as I think Pia already has hinted to in what are you going to do with all this data. Uh, but, you know, especially in the exploratory phase of what works for my materials, these can be really valuable. Or if you're doing something where you're automatically recombining the things and you want to put them into a computer algorithm that might to many of us basically be a black box, you just give it the whole stack of images, it runs a series of processes on it, it spits out, you know, whatever the algorithm has decided to do. And so in that case, you might not want to make the decisions because you may not be seeing the things that the computer is seeing. And it's again a point that I'll make in my slides is that computers and cameras see what we have designed them to do, not necessarily what we think they should see. Um, and that comes down to really fundamental things like uh, if you see here we have two lasers and these lasers when they intersect, show that this is in focus. Uh, because we cannot focus this camera for a couple reasons. One, we don't see into the invisible spectra that we are photographing with. Uh, we could theoretically do it through the live view here uh, and then focus it each time. Uh, but also, this is a special uh, type of lens. A normal lens, like the one that the videographers are using, has a series of coatings on every element. And there's a series of glass pieces we call elements. The front one is the one that you're most familiar with, and if you take it off, there's another one in the back. Uh, but there's 
10, 13 inside. And many of these have coatings to stop all the problems with light on glass, glare reflections. UV light is a big one that they often coat to remove. And again, we want to be able to see in the UV spectrum. So this uh, lens has been designed not only to not have coatings that will interfere uh, with shooting in these uh, normally undesirable spectra, but it actually focuses slightly differently given the physical properties of the light uh, that we're dealing with. And uh, because of all of these things, uh, even more than in the visible light where the laser is a precision tool, the laser is really how we know whether something's going to be in focus at all. Uh, especially since, as you remember, in operation, this is what you see, and then you hear click, whirr, click, whirr, click, whirr. It's not extraordinarily exciting at the time. But, um, so the whole setup here is, in principle, extremely similar to what you've seen with the Scratz book tables. It's obviously in a tent because we want to block out all light that we are not uh, ourselves putting in. We have a set of LED panels, and I will take the covers off, and uh, you can come and look in. You need to get at a very low angle if you want to come in with the camera, and you can see that there are a whole set of different uh, LEDs under there that are under a diffuser. And so we are actually using different LEDs that are specific to each of the range. So I encourage you all to come in, stick your head in there, see what's going on. These are a specific product from Megavision, uh, which is the supplier of these panels. There are other panels. There are some solutions that are designed to be a little more field ready, uh, where they actually kind of will work with big handheld UV lamps or the sun, again, is an excellent source of UV light. Um, I should have had you speak because at uh, Rochester, they have been doing this giant map under multispectral light. And of course, that won't fit into a setup like this. So they have turned the entire room they photograph into, into a black room. Makes for some fantastic websites. Look up the Lazarus Project at Rochester at some point and see their photos of them working because their promo images are great because they've got all these fancy colored lights in a completely dark room. It works great. And then they also have a, a wonderful tool which I encourage you to try out where they have one of the sly uh, curtain viewers of the map that they're working on in visible light and the map, how they've uh, recombined it with the additional information they got from the invisible spectra because some of the inks which are degraded in visible light still show up strongly in these other spectra. And so you can suddenly read this map, which, you know, looks blurry. Um, so here we might be using this for the palimpsest you saw yesterday, which is under conservation uh, rules at the moment, so I can't handle it. Uh, but uh, say, for example, I had a set of images that had different colored inks, and I was wondering, you know, can we possibly tell them? Now, the best technical way for this would be to use an actual spectrographic analysis, but that is something that our lab doesn't have, requires us to send stuff to other labs. And depending upon the pigments, some of these pigments, as we'll see in our slides, can be uh, highly clearly visible uh, under different spectrographic conditions, under different lighting conditions. And so, um, notably, one of the blues that was used later uh, in later forgeries of older items, uh, at the time you wouldn't know it. But now we can just basically take a multispectral photo and go immediately. That has to be taken after the invention of this blue sometime in the 19th century. 
so it can't be the much earlier item that it th says. Uh, other inks and pigments just don't currently show up well enough for us to really consistently tell uh, under um, our current technology, but this is something that is uh, constantly uh, being worked on and there's a lot of interesting work. Uh, I will put a link out in the slides for an excellent uh, article by Heide Lang where she really explains this for an archaeology and conservation audience, a lot of the work they're doing in identifying spectral responses. Um, so. Uh, our workflow here is, I will put our softeners back on, and of course the softeners are for the same reason there are diffusers over all the LEDs in the visible light there, is because we have points of light, but we don't want the fall off that we see in the various points of light as they appear on our images, we want it to be as evenly as possible. So what we have here is a variant of copy stand setup, which is you know, a very old way of doing duplication. Back from the days when to print something in newspaper, you took the photo, you printed it out on gelatin silver paint, uh, prints, you put it under a special copy camera, then you took that and you use that for the actual like production version of the image, right? It was a very physically mediated process in the way that our current digital technology isn't in that specific way. But as I hope the specifics of this camera make it clear, it is actually still physically mediated in a way that we don't necessarily think about. But it, these physical mediations appear in uh, visible light photography too, and we'll talk about a few of those in the slides. Um, so the workflow here would be, oh, you can see we have our nice little book cradle, slides back and forth. Uh, it also comes out, but there is a catch for it, and I have to be shown by Carl where the catch is every time, so I'm not going to try pulling it out uh, while he is not here. Um, and so here in our software, what you can see is that we have uh, the list of all our different colors that we can choose. They're uh, given a little bit of something that's human readable, like IR, and then we also get, you know, something like 940 to tell us what the actual, like, range is, so you can look it up on a chart. And then we also get to choose our different filters uh, in order to cut it off. Uh, over here that will help us restrict the range. And then here you get to see all of the normal photographic things that you would control on a camera, your shutter speed. We call it duration here because these are generally long shots because there's not a lot of light uh, that the camera is sensitive to, right? Because cameras are again, designed mostly for visible light. So we have to take longer exposures in many cases for these. And then the f-stop, and ours is just default set to 11, which is more or less enough to get something flat in complete focus without getting any of the kind of drop-offs in quality that you might see if you really uh, change the aperture to be smaller, which is a higher f-stop number if you uh, have done any photography. And so having set that all up, having made sure it's in focus using our laser, it's... We're shown on other side of the... Oh, I mean, it's not working at the moment, but I'll put this back up. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we put this down. Hopefully it automatically turns out the lights. And now, were our cable not broken, I would just push a button and everything that I ordered in the setup would then go and uh, be produced. Now interestingly, and I will show this in our thing, what we're going to get is only black and white images because sensors and camera are only sensitive to photons hitting them, right? So all they know is whether there is light or not. We create color by something called the Bayer pattern, which I'll show in a slide, 
but we've removed the Bayer pattern off of this because we're not shooting in red, green, and blue. We're shooting in a bunch of different things and we're controlling everything. So instead of having the red, green, and blue all taken at once, if we wanted to shoot red, green, and blue, we would shoot three images and we would recombine them. This actually means that you have four times as much color information for the same number of pixels, right? Because you are not uh, separating that color information over four colored pixels and then recombining it. You are shooting the color information you want on every pixel. So uh, that is um, just a different approach to photography. Of course, it only works if you can hold everything perfectly still in perfect reg registration. You're not going to wander around in daily life shooting red, green, and blue separately unless your camera is shooting extremely fast. The closest equivalent are the Fuji cameras, which have a sensor which is based upon the old film where they shoot red, green, and blue simultaneously on three different layers but that's only used by Fuji, and it's not the most common technology uh, that is used. Uh, what we would use is the same stuff you would see in Sony, Nikon, and Canon cameras, also in medium and large format backs like Hasselblads and stuff like that. They are all using essentially the same uh, type of backs. Um, we do still use color checkers, but here's the really interesting thing. I will show you some pictures of color checker cards under different colors of light. And they're unhelpful in two ways. Because what we're looking for is spectral response of pigments, right? And what a color checker card tells you is whether it is calibrated at the exact color response under a certain uh, color temperature of light, generally around 5200, right? So a very, what we would consider white light, because of course light has color, which is why I was asking like, are the overhead lights the same color as uh, our lights? Because that could cause color cast. Well, different reds might appear very different under multispectral. So um, there is a little thing here that has been added by Megavision. Uh, you can hold this, just please hold it like this, like you would hold a photograph, don't touch it. But if you see this little white spot at the top next to the ruler, that actually is there because it shows different uh, characteristics under different ranges of light. Because we're actually dealing with three different physical properties of light when we're dealing with multispectral cameras, right? There's the normal part that we'd expect where you shoot the stuff down, it reflects back to you and you see the light. But, you know, anyone who's ever done like a dark light, a UV demonstration knows certain things fluoresce under light, certain inks fluoresce under light. So not only are we shooting the directly reflected light, sometimes we're shooting the fluorescence. The fluorescence has different characteristics um, physically. And so we can actually filter it out or we can choose to filter it in, right? So these different types of light um, can tell us different things about different inks. And I think I'm gonna leave it there because I have slides which explain this better. Uh, but please ask us questions about the equipment. Please come in, stick your head in, see what's actually going on here. 90% of this is a completely normal copy stand setup. But that last 10% really enables stuff like those images you've seen from Sinai where they start to read these otherwise completely unreadable undertext and palimpsests. Uh, they enable things where, in some cases, if different inks were used for the original writing and the cancellation, say the original writing was done in uh, iron gall ink. The cancellation was done in like a plant-based walnut ink, like they've just painted over it. To us, we can't see through it. But there's completely different uh, spectral characteristics of the underlying ink. So there might be a range where the upper ink is completely invisible and the lower ink is completely visible and suddenly you can read through deletion marks or damage. And of course, this is what we do when we look at underpaintings 
uh, on paintings, which is very uh, favored among art historians because you can see the cartoons, or you can see that they actually started making a completely different thing, abandoned it, and then made a different painting over it because what they started with for sketching is visible in different spectral ranges than the actual paint you're seeing there. So please, at this point, stick your head in, take a look, ask questions. Um, this is something which we, uh, is, is fairly new to us. We've got the theory. We're, we're one cable away from Eric finally getting uh, his beloved palimpsest uh, digitized at Graz by us, uh, which I'm sure Carl is very much looking forward to because I think it's going to be a lot of work. It's under heavy conservation rules. It's very delicate, so uh, they're going to have to take some real care. But this is something that we're really looking forward to. And at the Center for Information Modeling, we've actually been developing a specific uh, data model for how we are going to store multispectral images in a way that is more helpful than just here is a folder with all the different spectral versions we've taken. And uh, one of our colleagues is presenting on that, Sarah, next week? I think so. Yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm very excited to look forward to it. I'm aware of it. I was not on that team. Again, I'm more of like the physical photography side. I do modeling of a different type of data, uh, which we will talk about at the MS description section. So please, questions, comments? So, uh, the cable that is uh, broken, uh, I suppose it's communicating the chamber with the computer or? Yeah, so it's a combination spliced together USB micro cable and the stereo cable, which actually controls the uh, triggering of some of the related functions because they have to extremely precisely work together. The solution was that instead of trying to sync two different cables on different ports, that they would both be triggered simultaneously by this one custom soldered cable. But unfortunately, that custom soldered cable broke and we can't just go get an off the shelf part for it. And uh, ripping apart USB micro cables and resoldering them was something that we decided that we weren't quite up to in terms of our technical soldering skills. I can do big things, really messy. I wouldn't trust it on small cables. So, so the, the company is, is sending it. But this is the kind of thing that Having seen this, you might think about when you're ordering your system, how many of the parts can you go and replace off the shelf? I'm not particularly concerned about any of these like big physical parts, but you know, um, the lens is irreplaceable, the filters are irreplaceable, the light panels, I mean, they're irreplaceable in the sense that we have to order that item. Uh, but what you don't necessarily think about when you're ordering a system is, hey, do we have special cables that uh, if they break are the one point of failure for our workflow? I mean, technically everything here still works, but what we have to actually do is pull the camera out because the SD card reader is not actually accessible from this position because it's not intended for it to be used like when you're in the field and you pop your SD card and you pop it out. It's always intended to be used from the workstation. Uh, I will just uh, leave this here. You can see, I think you can conceptually see what's happening even if you don't understand any of the actual text here because what this is is just allowing you to organize all that. So please come in here, ask questions. There's anything else you want to know? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of the ways I would like to use something like this. Mm -hmm. Two questions come to mind. First, how much would a researcher that needs imaging services from you to look at the manuscript that you own would have to pay for, to get like two pages? Uh, so far above my pay grade. So, I guess the real answer is if this was a project that I was personally involved with, like the Center for Information Modeling was somehow a partner in something, I would presumably 
do this as long as the rights were covered, uh, you know, under just the fact that we're doing research cooperation. However, if you're talking about as a service from the library, that is something that you, as Pia said, they actually run service for other uh, institutions. And so they probably don't even have a concept of how they would price this right now, since this is still very new to us. But that is definitely a question uh, which uh, we could approach. We have, for example, uh, research project where we're hoping to do with Klagenfurt where you know we're part of the research team they're part of the research team we're all co-publishing so in that sense it doesn't cost Klagenfurt anything except for the fact that they have to bring this incredibly fragile item over and uh, the mountains to us and take the risk of back and all the conservators hours of doing that but uh, that's because we consider it to be an internal project. Um, what it would be as a service, I could not say. Um, the, so we have this huge system at Rochester that is always broken, um, to be totally transparent. But at Rochester Institute of Technology, to your point, they've built a much smaller, much more portable and very affordable system that is intended to be for institutions that don't have the funds for a huge setup or conceivably for an individual researcher um, to be able to use if you knew how to do and it. That's actually... So, so I take my stuff more often to RIT because they have this little system that is always working. That's so. actually something that we did not consider as much as we might have before this. Um, because we have a specialist in creating this kind of excellent setup, uh, we hand it off to him and we got a setup that will fit a book. Well, you can see the size that will fit. What it will not fit is 3D museum items that our digital museology professor might want to use. Uh, there's nothing about the actual equipment inside there that says that we couldn't pull it off, put it on a table in a dark room, put it on a turntable, except that we did not design that into uh, our specifications when we did. So now we're thinking about, well, does this have the flexibility that serves all of our user groups? Um, because we were, of course, thinking of the library as the first user group. It is in the library. But for the same reason you do pigment analysis on, uh, or trying to look under underpaintings on a manuscript, you might want to do that on a vase. But the vase requires the same set up essentially at the 90 degree angle and it requires that the vase be on a turntable so you're not actually moving the vase and we are just not set up for that. Something that I thought might be interesting for our students is if we could take this to one of the local churches where they have these old kind of faded uh, wall paintings and we could see can you see traces of underpainting. It's not a research project per se of mine but it is really a pedagogical thing for students, but um, this current setup doesn't do that. So I really encourage you, uh, if you think about what your needs are, but not only your needs, but other users who are going to come to you and say like, oh, can I meet those users' needs too uh, before you commit to having it as it's not bolted to a desk. This thing is actually completely portable in the sense that anything that's heavy is portable. It fits in a van. We can drive it to a monastery that has a library if we had to. Like, um, we haven't arranged for anything like that. But if that came up um, and they won't move their manuscripts and somehow it can work out with digitization that works for their hours that they're going to go to them, this is entirely possible. This is sitting on a table, it is not attached. So it is completely portable in that sense, but it is definitely a book scanner. Um, so when you see all the different things that people are doing with multispectral imaging for digitizing different objects, think about, you know, this might not be the correct format for you, 
But on the other hand, if you're the British Library and you're just trying to deal with, I think actually the British Library outsources this. I'm looking in the wrong direction. Oh, right in front of me, I'm looking left and right. Uh, the British Library outsources this to a, another company who, who does it for them. But if you have that kind of volume of orders, then of course you could you know, support as many dedicated tools as you've got orders for. Um, but if you just want to teach students how it works, then uh, maybe you don't want to be constantly annoying the rare books library by booking space in the digitization lab and you want to have something that you can actually use in your teaching classroom. And um, so uh, this, is a, this is a great system, but I just encourage everyone before they think, oh, we need to get a system like that. This is about 60,000 euros, by the way. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the Rochester Institute of Technology thing uh, is less expensive and it fits in a golf bag, I believe I've been told, which I think is fantastic because in the US, I don't know if this applies in Europe, golf bags have some weird exemption to baggage rules. Um, so anything that fits into a golf bag is automatically plane portable, which is just brilliant on their side. They probably put it in a golf bag just because that was a convenient way to strap it around your back. But in terms of putting it onto a plane, at least in the US context, that's fantastic. So um, there's different companies, different vendors, they have different uses. Uh, so just think about what uses you have. And like I said, if you, in, like you said, if you have two pages, then either find out how much it costs to get somebody else to do it, or find a research collaborator who has one. And that, of course, con who controls the manuscript, whether they're willing to do it, whether they charge for that service is all tied up in that, and again, way above my, my pay grade. I'm a researcher, I'm not actually, you know, officially at the library, so. I think what you can also see is that we are working for researchers, but there's also very much research in itself, because we're constantly um, enlarging our port of uh, mm. machinery, and it's, this is also a collab collaboration project with the Zim, and um, we didn't came up with it ourselves. But it's great. The more you have, the more you get to experiment with it. And it's a bit like with the Traveler, which is, we had this big table, then they came up different needs, built a smaller one, and that's it. And something like this, as you said, no? you have this big setup, no, okay, that's not really handy. We need something, something smaller. So it's a current development going on. And you really need to think about what you need and what, as you said, also might need for the people. But also we have to think about this in Austria in kind of like a whole country perspective because there's a lot of shared resources. So uh, once the cable's fixed and we're a little more comfortable with it, there's actually a site where we put up all like these specialized resources. And we're going to say that you can contact the Centrum for Information Modeling and the Sondersammlung at the University of Graz, and we have this equipment, here's the technical thing. And so then potentially we would be a resource along with like the two other institutions in Austria that have comparable things for all the institutions that don't. Uh, and that partially comes with uh, a lot of shared government financing of the universities here, but also just a desire to promote cooperation between different Austrian universities of various sizes. Yeah, that's, same. that's true in general, I think, for our department, because you ask about costs, and um, one has to say, in uh, if you go for, like, um, if you have a, a company, you would not be able to do this, what we are doing here, because the prices are, like, in no relation to the workload, mm -hmm. so to say. But it's also this perspective First of all, we are funded by the government, so we, we don't charge, we don't have, need to have any winnings. We just need to break even in the end, you know. And uh, also, it's often, um, it's very often a research collaboration where we don't earn anything as such. We get new equipment, which is great, but that's what we get out of it. And everything else is, yeah, it's part of research, and we're not trying to achieve massive winnings and yeah. Uh, the software is, I believe, the one that is provided by Megavision. It's in a folder called Megavision. So uh, there's another one which actually just controls the lights, but the, the integrated software is a piece of the product that when we bought the Megavision light panels and the Megavision filter wheel, 
right? The software that controls the light panels and the filter wheel came with that. There are different ways to do this. And of course, the easiest way is you could manually do all this. You could just have a switchboard and turn on the lights. Um, it's better if you have some kind of automated way of moving the filters so you just don't have to open it every time to uh, so switch it. So you have it. to take it that in manually you have to arrange? Or, uh, so you create a shot list. I'm sorry, I'm again logged out. Uh, there's something about the way this is written in a German p keyboard, which I don't understand how to log in. It's also written by Carl, who's very much a digital man, and his handwriting is terrible. Ah, okay. <laughs> so yes, if you look at the shot list here, and you see color selection, uh, this is what I've actually been doing when I've just been turning on and off the uh, lights that turned it off. This will turn it on. So I just put it on. MB505 cyans, right? So you can see the light color has changed to cyan. Uh, but also here, here's the duration of the imaging. Uh, here's the delay between the images, the f-stop, and then the filters, right? So we want to cut off uh, the filter so it's not showing the whole range. And then here on the left, you see that there's a whole bunch of checkboxes because there's 20 different things that I can have pre-configured at a time. But maybe I don't want to shoot 20 images every time. So I select the ones which I have decided are the important images for this project, whether that's 20 or whether that's one. And that means that once this is properly set up and the cable's working, uh, and you've decided what your shot setup is for a project, you click a button here, you wait for it to click and whir, click and whir, click and whir. Maybe like go out of the room for a minute because it takes a couple minutes if you do all of them. And then you come back up, you turn the page, make sure it's refocused, and then you click the button again. And so that part of the automation is to make the images across every page of your project as comparable as possible. Um, there's no reason you couldn't choose a bespoke thing for every page. Um, and you might do that, for example, if you're seeing a specific pigment color. And so you might have a preset that says, identify blues. Um, and then you do that and you put that color list on. And you have a different one where you say like, let's try and see whether we can see the difference between vegetal and uh, iron gall inks. And so, those presets are on you to design. Uh, there's several articles out there where they've talked about um, creating workflows for this. But um, many of these articles have been published in the last 10 years because this is a really fast moving field. Even about 10 years ago, when we had uh, one of our Teuvian colleagues come down and work on the Palimpsest here. They were using much more primitive versions of technology that in some ways were a little better than just peering at it really hard. Uh, it increased the contrast sometimes, and other times it made stuff that's invisible, visible, that messed up the manuscript even more, right? Cause, like there might be hand oils or something else which has reflectance in invisible ranges that now is messing up your thing, which is often why we take a set of images so that we can recombine them uh, using, if people are familiar with Photoshop, there's these two blending modes, uh, multiply, the three, multiply, subtract, and divide, which are very powerful for taking two different versions of the same image and then saying everything that appears in this version, subtract it. Subtract it, there's four of these blending modes. There's a whole bunch of blending modes, these are the useful ones. Subtract everything that appears in this image from this image. So if you've got the overtext showing really well in this image, and the undertext showing really well in this image, but the overtext is still there, you could potentially just do them in Photoshop. You could also be using much more complex uh, technologies. Uh, there's been a lot of research recently with trying to use computer vision techniques, um, which is nice because it only deals with localized clusters. So instead of trying to fix the thing for the entire image at once, which might be 
problematic if there's some kind of fall off in pigmentation or something. It fixes it for whatever tiny square it's looking at, at a time, which means that it's always trying to look for the contrast in that tiny square. So you can increase the contrast uh, locally all over the image. Um, I don't currently have a lot of experience with that. Uh, we're hoping to have our colleague uh, who has been working on these things come down. There's only a very few papers about this that are out at the moment, so it's still something we're very much learning about. But as computer vision has taken off, computer vision and multispectral are just natural pairs because one of the great things about all these computer processes is processing huge amounts of data that are not necessarily self-evident for how to deal with them by hand. Um, so that's a big possibility uh, now and forward.